right. Welcome everyone. Um, this is Dan Kittredge from the Bionutrient Food Association. Uh, we're excited to have you all with us. We've got about 100 people signed in right now, it looks like. Another 325 that are registered that will probably call in a number of you. Um, really honored to have this global audience, uh, people from six continents, uh, over, over 30 countries and uh, more than 40 US states uh, to join us in this first um, of many conversations uh, we'll be having over the next eight months. Um, a new experiment in the structure of an online uh, conference. And uh, today we wanted to open up the whole process with a, a ceremony, um, just really deeply uh, engaging the questions of um, who we are, what we're doing here, and what our frame of reference is. Um, we hope to have a, a number of very inspiring presentations uh, over this next eight months, but really we wanted to open up today with this uh, this deeper framing. So uh, we will, um, there's a, a Q&A box as well as a chat box. People will be free to uh, chat in the chat box. Um, we are not planning to have people be able to speak today, but if there is something that you would like to have spoken um, at the end, uh, please feel free to put that in the Q&A box and um, Lindsay will re be reading things out for us. So thank you all for, for uh, joining and hope you have a wonderful time. Um, Rehi, I think I'll just hand it off to you. And I think you need to turn your video on. There he is, okay. Yes, thank you, Dan. Really appreciate that introduction and welcome everyone and those who are still in the way. We will be starting with a reflection. And after the reflection, Luis Marcos, one of the spiritual leaders of the Guatemalan Mayan community in the United States in exile, will be following with a ceremonial invocation following the energies that belong on today's um, uh, calendar of the Mayan people. <clears throat> this uh, first part is just a reflection. So if you have access to your screen, I'm gonna put it on the screen if you want to follow. We are going to primarily um, trigger a lot of questions and a lot of um, meditation with this statement. And we hope that you feel challenged, supported, and in your own growth. We gather today as creatures of indigenous to the earth. We gather to claim our roots and to realign our bodies, minds, and spirits with the elements of the earth, the source of our energy and the foundation of our being. We recognize that independent of our individual and collective beliefs, traditions and ways of being, defined by our cultures, native lands, struggles, and successes, we are at the end simply highly organized forms of energy that came to be because of the magnificent process of evolution. We recognize that we are organisms of the earth, no more, no less than all the other organisms that evolved along us as part of the earth's evolutionary process over billions of years. We recognize that all organisms on earth are dependent on each other and the ecosystems that they have shaped over millions of years. And that as human organisms, we too depend on all ecosystems that have evolved along with us. That we are part of the diversity of life on the planet, not outside of it. And that we depend on all life forms for our own survival. We gather knowing that we have sought to colonize every corner of the earth that our actions are counter to our own interest of permitting the evolution of li life to continue, and that we are on a journey to claim our indigenousness to the earth and to correcting our colonizing ways so we can again live and let live. We recognize this is a journey that will require courage, a full-blown intellectual insurgency of global proportions, paradigm shifts, and that it is not to be traveled alone, but collectively. We come into our individual and collective 
journey with intention and commitment, with integrity, dedication, patience, and ancestral innate wisdom that comes naturally when we allow its energy to flow within, through, and among us. We gather with the purpose of working collectively to reverse the negative impact of ways of thinking and doing things that result in social, economic, and ecological degeneration. We accept that we are part of a colonizing system, but come to this gathering with a true commitment to further understanding these issues and developing plans and strategies to heal the living systems of the planet, especially our own humanity. We recognize that we cannot do this without a clear mind, without integrity, and without self-awareness of our own complicity with degenerative ways. We recognize our complicity in perpetrating a colonizing system centered on extraction, exploitation of nature, people, and animals, a system that disregards our own dependency on creation. We recognize our complicity with racism in agriculture, and we commit to identifying, exposing, and dismantling structures of racism and discrimination. We recognize our complicity with the global system of power that generate the conditions of injustice, the displacements of native people, the mass oppression of and exploitation of migrants for the sake of profit and cheap food. We recognize that the system that is destroying the planet was built by and is supported by our collective actions and the infrastructure we have built. And we also clearly see that a different system is possible and that just as the current one was imagined and then built, we can also imagine and build a different one, one more reflective of our indigenous self and less of our colonizing self. We commit to making this gathering a safe space for all expressions that seek to find a path to indigenization and decolonization. We commit to, commit to peace, tolerance, and to focusing on the common goals and objectives while recognizing that we are unique individuals and organizations, that we also have differences. We commit to letting those differences also be expression of our own collective diversity and to support each other as much on the common areas as we will seek to collectively uh, in collective impact and in our individuality so that everyone feels validated, welcome, and supported. With that, I'll pass it on to Luis Marcos, who will lead us on an invocation. And um, so, good afternoon um, from the sacred uh, homelands of the Omaha Nation um, in the Midwest of uh, the United States here, um, the state of Nebraska and Western Iowa, the traditional home of the Omaha. It's a distinct honor to be here, to be asked and uh, to say a few words uh, in prayer. It is my understanding that um, there are many uh, present from all six continents and uh, 40 states within the continental United States. Today in the sacred um, calendar is Ucheb Czech. It is important uh, to honor the four cardinal points. Uh, the east, the west, the north, the south. And this technology that is allows us uh, today to also hear one another and connect with one another. We are here at the same place uh, on the strict land of the Omaha Nation. The Maya crop representing um, equilibrium. We ask for our mental health, our physical health. We ask for spiritual health and emotional health. Today,
can represent today is the energy for authorities. Today, as leaders, we are asked by our ancestors to step into our powers, if you will, and heal, heal our common humanity, heal Mother Earth. We are all authorities in many different ways and in many different levels. Some of us are parents and some of us are grandparents. And so we are asked today to reflect on that and how we're guiding our children and what we're living for the future generations. Some of us hold decisions in our organizations. This is a day to reflect on how we exercise such leadership. It is also a day uh, to pray for elected officials. And it's a day, most importantly, it's a day to pray so that governments of contemporary states have a working relationship with governments of indigenous peoples based on the principles of justice and um, mutual collaboration. Let us then join in prayer and say, and say Mamin Chikai Pishan Satkan Pishan Satchor Chiko Panaye Shish Mamin Chiko Panaye Shish Chikai Yi Palil Ko Pishan Yi Palil Ko Napal Yi Palil Ko Mi Manil Yi Palil Geranil Ko Napal Shish Mamin Shish Chikai Atosan El Bush Tatila El Guana Tatila Lanan wah kwan bae, yet ashtet mami, yet ashtet chikai. Chi yan tenep, hantak masa nil, paite li lana chet ni a chuch tor, lana na on kolobe, lana na on kuka. Our creator, our father, our mother, we ask for your blessing, we ask for your guidance, we ask for your healing. Today, as these leaders from many different parts, from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south, come together to have this conference, to have these conversations, to have this dialogue about how to make this world a better world for all. There is enough resources for all. There is no need for children to go hungry, to starve to death in so many parts of the world, but to get to that level where we all have access, change must happen. And we are the ones who can do it. And we are the ones we were waiting for. We ask you, Father Sky, Mother Earth, to give us strength as we progress in this conference today. Thank you uh, for the honor to open this conference. Uh, and I wish you the best. And uh, I certainly hope that we uh, connect pretty soon here. Thank you, Luis. Thanks for the inspiration. Thank you.
Thank you, Chris. We're going to move on to the next uh, stage here. We have divided this first day into three main components. The first part, which we have now concluded with Luis's invocation. The second part, which is a exercise in decolonizing and indigenizing the mind. And the third stage, which will become a community expression. So, um, Chris or Dan, would you like to give again the um, the instructions for how people are to participate? I'll give you a few seconds here to intervene, and then I'll get back to this. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so the idea is that um, people should feel free to uh, chat in general on the on the the. The, the chat box and that uh, if there are thoughts, inspire, inspirations, feelings um, that you would like to share or have shared um, publicly by being vocalized uh, to put those in the Q&A box. Um, so as Rahi's working us through uh, the brilliant <laughs> insights that he has to offer, if you feel inspired to comment, um, the way we're going to be framing it is that you know put put those comments in the Q and A box and then and then we'll uh, read them out at the end uh, at the end of the time today. So I think that's basically it. Thank you. And yeah. including your, I, I'm assuming we can see your name so that and Lindsay would be taking charge of giving that voice. And um, as she does that, uh, she will be merely representing your voice because of the way we are having to do this technologically, uh, but it is your voice. There will be no question and answers per se. This is not a top-down lecture. This is a place for sharing and for exploring our own innate intelligence. That's the foundation of decolonizing the mind. So there will be, nobody will be answering anything. It is for everybody to have an expression based on how they feel inspired and how they are finding their ways as we go through these exercises. So I will be sharing my screen to guide you through this process that we have followed uh, here. And by we, I mean uh, many individuals, over 150 of us who are now part of the regenerative poultry system. And that has allowed us to, act, to practice these ancestral ways of thinking, of knowing, and uh, which we have brought into directly into engineering processes and farm designs and system level design, economic design, governance and organizing and all of that. So the critical thing to understand is that as we say regenerative agriculture, when I say it, it is the representation of an ancestral and indigenous way of thinking, of being, of knowing, knowing of relating, relating to the rest of life on earth. It is not a practice on the land. It is not, it is not something reduced to a single icon or a market claim or a label. It is a way of being. That's regenerative. And so that's the ancestral way we understand that. And so regenerative agriculture for us simply is. If you are either a applying it or you're not. It doesn't matter, it cannot be validated by the conventional system. It is not something that we, that we want even to be validated by the conventional scientific community, which is the same scientific community that validated the very system that today is destroying the earth. Morally, that community uh, can follow and can incorporate regenerative into their ways. They are welcome to but they, are, they, they, they lost the moral authority to validate indigenous ancestral ways. Decolonizing the mind, indigenizing our ways is clearly, and it is truly a path to re regeneration. We skip that and we end up reducing and whitewashing the concept, the ancestral way of thinking, which is given to us, not by current generations or the last three or four, this is, this is a way of being that has been preserved by native communities across the world and that is responsible for having preserved over 80% of the biodiversity on earth 
on over on around 20% of the land and by over 370 million native communities that continue to practice this indigenous ways without that effort and without them having many of them died and fought and 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 struggled to keep those ways of be, doing things and being and thinking today none of these folks who are coming into this space would have access to a lot of this knowledge if it weren't for them they are the two art authors and they're the ones who we owe this knowledge and this wisdom and it is just fair that we recognize that anywhere we are, just at the same time where we recognize where we are physically. I am right now in the land of the Maya, in the land of the Kachikel people in Guatemala. And this is where I'm transmitting for. I currently live in the Lakota territories in Minnesota. Two things we need to understand before we keep going forward. First, what does it mean to be indigenous or to indigenize? This is a process of self and collective reflection and conscientization that results in a way of seeing, comprehending, learning, interacting, and working as part of, not with, Earth's natural systems and with each other based on an identity that reflects our dependency on natural living systems a process by which we take on our responsibility to preserve, respect, and protect the evolutionary processes that generated the conditions that allowed for the emergence and will ensure the preservation of diversity of life on the planet, and that includes our own. Everyone can be indigenous. Indigenous is not the same as being a native of a territory. We are all born indigenous of the elements of the earth. That what is what makes us indigenous. Now, whether we practice that which we are born with, that indigenousness, that's another question that we need to reckon with now. Decolonization, on the other hand, is that process in the, that results in the transformation of ownership, control, and governance systems and structures that currently are responsible for, for perpetrating the, uh, the profit driven extraction of Earth's resources and the appropriation, destruction, expropriation, and extermination of indigenous-centered cultures and resources and the disruption of Earth's living systems. It is a process that results in the application of modern expressions of ancestral indigenous ways that place the living systems of the Earth front and center as we define and plan the future of humanity. That is decolonization. It's not the return of a colony to the communities. If the colonization systems are still there, that's not decolonization, which is a way that has been defined. Now, these are key outcomes that we need, uh, indicators that we need to become familiar with as we examine our colonizing culture. First is the fact that we accept, that we accept the, um, I hope that didn't um, interfere with my presentation here. The acceptance and perpetuation of extractive and exploitative practices, the community social and economic independence is compromised, legitimization and legalization of violence against anything that is counter to the system, such as ancestral traditions and knowledge, culture, food sovereignty, the legitimization of abuse of government sponsored corporate takeovers and market manipulation, concentration of ownership and control of whole systems from land to market, systematic, systematized repression of indigenous knowledge and science, which results overall in the uprooting of spirituality, spiritually grounding traditions, individually raising to the bottom, consumerism, climate disruption, ecological collapse, war, conflict, disease, and social breakdown. Those are the key outcome indicators of a colonizing culture. Key indicators of decolonized cultures include natural resources that are managed in perpetuity, not extracted for short-term gains. This is, this is what in, in, in native communities who practice indigenous ways around the world have been doing and, and literally begging the rest of the world to adapt. 
And it seems like the time has come, but we may actually be in a better position to put this common sense. Social and economic interdependence is supported as a foundation of success. Now think about what we consider success today under a colonized mindset. Ancestral traditions, knowledge, wisdom are validated, not repressed, to ensure collective mental, physical, and spiritual well-being. Regenerative agriculture is four-dimensional. It's social, it's economic, it's ecological, but it's primarily spiritual. Governance, organizing, and production infrastructure reflect community needs and priorities that for collective wealth creation and distribution. Now, read that as many times as you want to internalize it. But this is what regenerative actually, regenerative systems actually reflect, especially on their governance. Whole supply chains from land to fork are collectively controlled and governed. It is impossible to have justice in a system where this is not true. Defending, protecting, enhancing collective interest is structured within the system level governance as structures us at all levels. And at all levels, we're going to get to that in a second, what we mean by that. Overall, spirituality and traditions are uplifted. Collective assets management, collective asset management raises quality of life. Basic needs are met. The environment is protected locally and globally. Resilient is a central goal. Conflict is managed, not, not a social rules centers on accountability inter, and interdependency. Health focuses on well-being rather than the management of disease. And wealth is built and shared, not extracted. Understanding the colonizing process, place yourself whatever you want on this and then reflect on it. First of all, there is a step of discovery that always happens. There is a new idea, new land, new people, a new concept, a new story. There's always that discovery, that urge to go out and do that. Then comes the naming of the discovery, whether it was America, whether it was the Indies, whether it is the concept of regenerative. That's the, ne the next step. Normally we go from that to appropriate and expropriate. Most of the time is legally, Sometimes it's just because there is bullying going on and that is taken. Such as land grabs, trade rules, copywriting, trademarking, branding, patents of life, certification schemes. These are ways we appropriate and expropriate this ancestral knowledge and ways from indigenous communities and from each other. We standardize and scale repression, ownership and control systems, whether it's through policies, corporate personhood, legislation, privatization of the commons, armies, I mean, you name it. We have more expressions of how we do this than anything else that we could probably think about. We build systems to repress indigenous thinking and attempts at re-indigenizing ways of living and intellect. Scientific invalidation or co-opting of indigenous knowledge, that's one way we do that. Subsidizing pseudo-solutions, at the cost of real permanent well-being and progress. I mean, just look at some of the large, super rich individuals right now putting out their pseudo solutions that they invented somewhere, yet around the world, there is literally hundreds of thousands of real and permanent solutions that generate well-being and progress that are being, uh, being isolated and discriminated against because of those pseudo solutions that are being put, put out. That is important for us. It's important for us to understand how colonization expresses itself all across our culture. But then now let's understand what decolonization means. One, one way we can achieve this is by, again, rediscovering our original systems, again, bringing back the ideas, the concepts, the stories that made such a magnificent um, uh, way of dealing and managing and interacting with, learning and being with the rest of creation. Renaming, reclaiming, and resecuring, whether it's the concepts, the ideas, the stories, the land, the lakes, rivers, rituals, traditions, you name it. There's so much out there that is going away because we have not adopted, brought it back, renamed it, reclaimed it, and resecured it. 
then we need to rebuild community governing and protection systems. Fortunately for us, many, many native communities across the world now are re-indigenizing their governance systems. They are governing holistically. They are organizing by sector specific, specific which call affinity groups. They are validating those uh, efforts and they are um, backing up their local governing councils so that as they aggregate, they are, they are increasing the ability to rebuild community governance at a much larger scale. This is true from Guatemala to Colombia to British Columbia, where we have observed this firsthand. We need to standardize the processes to reclaim and return Aboriginal systems to their original purpose, which was the support of holistic thinking, the appreciation and enjoyment of life, and the design and engineering to ensure the full expression of all living organisms. That's really the, 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 the original purpose. It was not about extraction and profit. Expand and organize new systems. We need to scale up organizing. We need to localize from a localized, regional, and nationally. We need to aggregate those representations and that organization and eventually build what we are calling the governing councils so that we can develop a US based and then global uh, regenerative agriculture congress or a governing structure that can allow us to govern on the basis of this. Uh, ways of thinking and on true cons and the true concept of regenerative thinking. So, what does it look like indigenizing and decolonizing? In the case of agriculture engineering, we need to remember that agriculture engineering is primarily a tri dimensional affair from an engineering perspective. And from a living perspective, it's a four dimensional affair where the ecological, the economic, and the social are governed by these spiritual principles and our commitment to supporting life on Earth. Basically, the triple bottom line that everybody talks about is only possible if we start with the spiritual. Without the spiritual, the triple bottom line has no foundation. So in this case, we're looking at a, a space. For us, it's about chickens, because that's what we have chosen as an entry point for our communities to become part of a larger scale uh, uh, agriculture si uh, system. We see the land not as a flat piece of surface, but rather as a three-dimensional space on, where, on which we manage not production, but energy transformation. And for that to happen, we start way below the ground and we go way above the chicken so that we can actually integrate the full potential of a space and we allow for the expression, the full expression of all forms of life that are supported by that transformation and flow of energy. And out of that flow, yes, we harvest some in the form of chicken, eggs, vegetables, fruits, corn, other things, multitude of things. But that is a harvest of energy, not a production of anything. When you see the chicken in our system, this is what you see, the chicken, the forest, and all that goes with it. The digestive tract of the system of the chicken as a large scale energy transformation process, the photosynthetic process of the trees and the upper and lower canopy as a fundamental place where photosynthesis transforms massive amounts of energy that can then become forage for chickens or food for microorganisms so that more energy is transformed and harvested from meat to eggs to fruits and so on, where more energy will be coming through in the form of non-edible forms, such as manure, feathers, and giblets. Those can be maybe not edible to us, but they are edible to other microorganisms, which then transform that energy into sources of nutrients for grains, vegetables, and medicinal herbs, and a multitude of other diversity of life, which some of it becomes part of our plate some of it becomes part again of the supply or, or the energy flows that goes back into the system again with an average harvested energy of no more than 30 to 40% and 70% of it going back into the system to become the energy seed bank for the next cycle. That is the decolonization process where we go from moving from production into energy transformation as a foundation of efficiency and from there, generate the measuring um, 
the measurements that would validate then the, um, the, the, the performance of the system rather than uh, kicking of bushes per acre or pounds per, per acre as a foundation of uh, efficiency measurements. Now, if you take the chicken and put it within a landscape view as, a, as an economic foundation, then you will see that you have the chicken gives way to poultry processing facilities, egg processing facilities, manure management facilities that then become the source of energy for vegetable production farms, which also the processing facilities for the chicken generate byproducts that can be consumed by, by meat eating um, animals such as uh, fish um, and on and on the structuring, not, not of farms of production, but rather of enterprise sectors that then allows us to conglomerate and build regions that are fully integrated so that they can be holistically managed, but also governed. This allows us to vertically integrate the operationality of regenerative uh, systems, but also do the most important part, which is the horizontal, horizontalization of governance, ownership, control, and especially the distribution of wealth, distribution of risks, and distribution of benefits. If you were to look at a diagram of a decolonized organization, this would be, or ecosystem, this is more or less what it would look like. In the outside would be many expressions of egg, broilers, turkey, and other producers. And the next level will be their representative consuls. In the next level would be representatives of those consuls coming together based on affinity. And in the center would be the actual either regenerative poultry uh, American Congress or Global Congress or the Regenerative Agriculture Congress of America. That is the only place where we should allow certification, standards, the development, and overall governance of the system to happen. If we remove it from there, we are colonizing it and we are extracting it from the original, uh, original ancestral way that this is supposed to have been done. So, I'll leave you with a final mantra, if you want to call it, to remember. So if you farm, farm, but be a producer no more. Be a steward of energy and transformation. Engage money, but be an extractor of wealth no more. Be a partner and ally. Work for justice and equality, but be a savior no more. Be an insurgent in your own colonized world. Buy food, but be a consumer no more. Be a steward of your body, mind, and spirit. And because of your choices, the whole supply chain will change. The end result is a natural regenerative system. So, I hope this generated a whole new level of brain activity for you. Hopefully, it challenged your assumption. Hopefully, this would generate new expressions um, from your own experience. And I will invite you to start engaging your own innate intelligence. Most of us came into this world uh, of regenerative agriculture from that standpoint. Um, not because we got a degree on regenerative or anything like that. Most of us were raised to think this way. Uh, and that is fundamentally uh, what we call innate intelligence. Um, my father, who was a critical element in my life, uh, there's more people who have good fathers. Uh, he didn't, he still doesn't write or read all of the intelligence and all of the intellect that was transferred to us from him and the neighbors was developed through silence, through meditation, to sharing stories and through observing each other in nature in the most incredible ways that we could ever have dreamt of in the rainforest. And most of us have a source of innate intelligence like that. And we would like for those expressions to materialize now in the way 
that they and everybody else had, had um, uh, instructed before. So this is not a question and answer as, as, as a section going forward now, but rather it is a space for your own expressions, for your own indigenousness to come up and for us to know about it. So Lindsay would be, will be reading those expressions as they come in and we'll see how we go, how we do from here then. This is unexplored territory, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, I don't see anything coming up in the Q&A yet that people feel like they want to uh, share or um, or have, have shared. I think probably they're if at all like me, um, digesting. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I feel like, I mean, I appreciate your uh, um, reading reading through the slides. I also feel like you sometimes, if you're not looking at the slides, can make some points more eloquently. Um, I'm not sure if there's, if there's some key things that you wanted to um, re repeat or emphasize. Uh, maybe that will help stimulate people's uh, engagement. Yes, absolutely. And Lindsay, I see, uh, I see you are unmuted. So uh, interrupt if you find any voice that needs to be uplifted, uh, please. Okay. Uh, we have to make this a monologue. So th there are some things that lately I have been exposed to, and it seems to be coming out quite often. One of them is uh, the a lot of organizations are finding themselves confused uh, currently, not only because of the challenges we are facing, but because of, of a new realization of our interdependency and relationships and the pandemic, you know, George Floyd, of course, all of those have been incredibly, incredible disruptors of our, the way we have been approaching things. And so this concept of indigenization and decolonization has started to generate a little bit more of that conscientia, as we call it. And one of the things that have happened out of that is this incredibly increasing demand for some of us uh, to go out there and teach some of this, some of this way of thinking. And honestly, it has caught, caught some of us by surprise. Um, by surprise, because we think of this as a way of doing things where you learn by engaging your own, your own ways of, of changing and your own transformation. It's a transformative process. And, and so, yes, we're doing that. But let's remember that, that too often we have invalidated these ways of thinking, ridiculed it, and that we need to be sensitive and respectful of those who have you know, dedicated their lives to preserving these ways of doing things. And if we are going to engage them, do that respectfully and, and with full consideration of their time and commitments and all that. Um, bring in the message of connection and youth enjoyed. So there is some, some questions that are coming up. Uh, are you catching anything yet, uh, Lindsay? Yep. Um, well, one of them that just came in is in your experience, bringing the message of connection to youth and joy of task and reward. So I think it's uh, asking about uh, adding in these other kind of uh, aspects of, um, of regenerative that you're speaking to. Yes, it's been very rewarding. Last um... Last night, I actually testified um, as part of the climate generation uh, in Minnesota. And one of the, the stories I shared was a recent walk that my 17-year-old and I took to the Appalachian Mountains. And he had asked me, you know, I, I had asked him, why, why is it that so many youth are, are disconnecting and and choosing to disengage and sometimes even, you know, running on drugs and other, finding other ways to cope with the current state of the world. And, and he said, just with no, not much hesitation, I'll paraphrase because I remember the exact words, but he said very much, you know, we have 
we we have been left with no choice. You left you and your previous generation left us a world that is in that is in is a catast cat catastrophe with an ecology that can no longer support us with systems that are destroying the earth. And where are we supposed to find hope in all of this? Of course, we had 17 days and 125 miles to process that. And that was a blessing. But one of the things I noticed, not only with my son, but also with all of the youth that I have been able to work with is that they really need instruction. They need wisdom. They need um, sacred instructions, as Sherry Mitchell put it in her book, uh, Sacred Instructions, um, the, in, in, is about decolonization of the mind. And if you want to read further into, into a lot of this, Sherry Mitchell presents a very, very deep and unique perspective. And, and with the way she posed it also is the way we need to be posing it to the youth. And to engage, we must first answer the, re, the, the question as to why. Why, to what end? And to what end? You know, the world is not gonna end. Their kids, them and their kids are going to be here. That's the end to, by which, to which we have to engage. But also understanding that they don't have the tools anymore. We also stole the tools and we built infrastructure that prohibits them. It keeps those who want to return to indigenous ways from actually activating. And that's what's frustrating you to the extent that we can generate these kinds of instructional manuals even, you know, places of learning and places of meditation and to developing that true intellect, more youth will be engaging. That has been our experience. And, and right now it's, it's, it's looking much better than it was even two years ago. So anyway, I, I think mm -hmm. I expanded too much mm -hmm. on that. Yeah, so just a few more, um, I'll just voice a few more things that we're seeing here. Uh, you know, one is uh, one of the reflections, this is from uh, Jeff Parrott, one of the reflections I've been having over the past year is what has been called cultural appropriation. I think this is often said in reference to commercialization as opposed to adoption. How do we address this if we expect to propagate regenerative practices? You know, I think that's a great, that's a great reflection so much of what we have in agriculture has been appropriated. And in order for us to indigenize, I think that's a wonderful thought for us to think about. A um, couple more, particularly, this is from Many Hands Organic Farm, particularly white Americans with the European heritage often feel overwhelmed by guilt just for having grown up with our white privilege. Can you speak to how those of us who come from the heritage, from that heritage, can dissolve that guilt and move forward and perhaps get in touch with their own agricultural heritage, wisdom, and intuition? In my perspective, guilt is a colonizer's way of, of limiting the full expression of those who want to do something against colonizing systems. Guilt is an inhibiting power. Guilt is useless. Guilt is simply not an appropriate way to express our complicity with the colonizing systems. In fact, it is, it is the, the, the complicity should be a motivator for us to explore further how we can more fully be ourselves. This is, um, this is a space where we could do, and hopefully you will reach out, and many others will reach out, and we can explore this further. Because one of the, one of the, the, the very things that I, I taught my children and anybody else that I come into connection with is that what we do with our privileges, because remember, privilege, we all have privileges. I am a very, very privileged person. I am privileged of having been born and being raised in extreme poverty. That's one of my greatest privileges because that taught me the value of being practical, of being deliberate, of speaking with honesty and with the truth. Now, that is a privilege that a lot of white privileged folks don't have because they, they grew up in an artificial environment. So I have that privilege and I am here using that privilege to bring it out to you. So if you're a white person who's having those issues with white guilt, use that privilege. Use that privilege to stand up for what is true, 
for learning the truth, for accessing resources, for spreading those resources, for standing in between somebody who's being oppressed, discriminated up against, or being violated in their rights, for standing up for all of the wrong that is in the world. Use your privilege. Witness for Peace, for example, used white privilege internationally to send folks from the United States and Canada and other parts of the privileged world into our communities in Guatemala so they would stand in between the community leaders and the army because by the fact that they were foreigners, white foreigners in between us, then the army felt more compelled not to shoot and kill those individuals. That was an excellent, absolutely dignifying way of using white privilege. And there is hundreds and hundreds of ways where, where that privilege, instead of becoming a source of guilt, becomes a sense of pride and a sense of purpose and becomes a way to validate yourself as a true, full human being. That's what I would say to that in this short time we have here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm seeing some comments uh, to the fact of, you know, opening opening minds up to defining words like indigenization and decolonization. Um, and so I think that was really, it seems helpful. Uh, the comment from Norm, I recognize innate wisdom as being paramount importance and foundational to any kind of regenerative future. You know, this being able to identify that indigenization, re-indigenization um, and decolonization. I think you really brought that out today, Rahim. Uh, comment from Fred Yen. I recently experienced some elders of an indigenous culture that was not colonized, the Teyuna of the Sierras Madres of Colombia. How do we blend the thousands of year old wisdom and culture into the decolonization efforts? I think the first thing we have to do is validate, validate those, those systems and validate the people. And to the extent that they have suffering that they recognize and they are asking help to be supported that we recognize that and that we bring those who have extracted their resources uh, to compensate them and to you know deliver some of the benefits that they have extracted so that there is accountability but especially i think the validation of that and not only the validation of it but if it's going to be validated and then use for other purposes that the use is also compensated just like i was saying about so many folks who now need to be trained on indigenous ways and decolonization there, there, there are resources to be exchanged as well and wealth you know capital all of that can be those are tools tools that can be used to decolonize i mean decolonizing wealth is a real thing and the way we decolonize it in part is by bringing Bring in some, in some ways, capital, and in some cases, even technology. I mean, a lot of indigenous communities who have held ancestral ways of doing things also understand that evolution is real, and they themselves embrace that and are willing to evolve. The key is not to allow for the imposition of extractive systems, because that's how we are using technology and other forms of so-called progress today. So there, there is, um, and there is also the, the, the very organizations that represent those communities. I mean, the fact that those communities exist is testimony to the, to the organizing and governing structures that they have preserved. Without those organizing, those ancestral ways of organizing and governing, they wouldn't be around anymore. And so that needs to be validated and expanded and brought out so that those sources of wisdom and capacity of, uh, and, and, and tools are, are expanded outwards into spaces where we are suffering from the, at the, at the hands of colonizing systems. And that, that's why uh, British Columbia also uh, Aboriginal peoples are doing. They, they have the, um, still have the hereditary chiefs um, infrastructure in place. They are restructuring that so that they can also continue to bring that that way of thinking and governing and doing things into the uh, into the government imposed consoles or, or so. Uh, so there's there's a lot more to it, of course, but there is a validation process that is happening. Uh, there is a resurgence of some of those Aboriginal ways, even in communities that that were not left intact. And those that were left intact 
can and should be validated so that we continue to learn and to change the ways we do things outside of those communities. So not, not saying that we should leave them isolated and alone, but we definitely be fully respectful of the fact that they are there because they, they have ways that are much more sophisticated and that are more representative of the humanity that we all should aspire to. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, so I see um, a couple of related comments here. So one Fern, Fern Bradley in the chat said, Rehi, did you use the term four-dimensional agriculture? That is a wonderful way of conceptualizing regenerative agriculture. And, and I know you added that the, the fourth, the spiritual to our, our, our three-legged stool or our triple bottom line. And in understanding that four-dimensional agriculture, um, we have Sarah Rose Kareem here saying, peace and thank you, Reginaldo. Can you speak on some of the ways you tap in to a higher power or innate intelligence while engaging in the work of regenerative agriculture in so-called production farming? What does this look like for you? Or do you have any practical suggestions for us to be able to work from a place that is connected to a higher intelligence rather than relying on our own limited understanding? Well, first of all, um, first of all, recognize that you are not limited. First step, the mind doesn't open up if you condition it to be limited. So take your time and practice, not believing that you don't know or that believing that you can't, but rather believing that not only you can, but also that you have the knowledge, you just haven't discovered it yet. That's another way to put the process of learning. Practically speaking, there are many ways we can access the subconscious and the, and the amount of knowledge and wisdom we already have that is normally just dormant. And this is real. This is scientists are talking about this, have been talking about this for quite a while in the context of innate intelligence. So, and remember that some of our intelligence is inherited. We pass it on. So to the extent that we are practicing some of this before we have children, we are passing on some of this in our own genetic makeup because we do get, the evolution is about how our, our genetic blueprint is continuously adapted just like plants and other organisms, just like the bugs that we spray with, with chemicals can change the genetic makeup so they can adapt, so do we. We are not foreign to any of that. So in that context, for example, the, um, the Tibetans use meditation a lot to access that, that inner, uh, that interconsciousness. Um, Dan Kittredge can probably speak to uh, a lot of other traditions. In my own case, I use a few things. I do meditation, but I do it in the forest. The forest, why? Because there is, there, we evolved over the forest and we are, we are synchronized with the over 400 plus, I don't know, it's probably more like 600 of the chemicals that trees and shrubs and the ground itself and even the, 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 the organisms around us emit. There is a vibratory connection that we have, which when our brain is exposed to that in a calm, receptive way, we are able to access and to generate connections that we will never generate in the absurd noise and you know electromagnetic disruption that our overly polluted world generates. The forest at least is one place where we can do that. The Japanese call it forest bathing because they have for decades identified those incredible benefits for the brain, for the heart, for all of our organs because we are technically synchronized with that. But as you do that, you know, remember that the true intellectual capacity of an individual, the true definition of intellect is really that which comes from meditation, from silence, from observation, and from priming, continuously priming your own being and your own brain and your whole internal ecosystem to interact with that outside ecosystem. And so in the forest is, is the prime place where you can do that. Parallel to that, if you have chances of sleeping in the forest, when we are asleep, we also, have this large scale processing mechanism that we have evolved into over millions of years and which is in high resonance and in tune with all of these other organisms. And within that, you can do other practices such as uh, dream priming, as lucid dreaming, 
and then um, become conscious with, you know, which is the concept of lucid dreaming and then access intelligence that you have stored in there that is not available again, even if you are meditating in the forest, but you are still awake. So those are two layers, very practical, very simple, not only spiritually renewing, but also um, physically um, manifested in improvements in how we think and we access that innate intelligence. And finally, rituals. Sherry Mitchell agrees with this, the fact that the spirituality and, and rituals and traditions doesn't have to be static. In fact, it has never been. You know, the incredible, incredible colors and dances and all of the stuff that we see today in a lot of the native communities, indigenous traditions and, and ways, that didn't start that way. They evolved. Maybe it was a two steps or something in the, you know, many hundreds of years ago, and it turned into a full dance later. Maybe it was just a few feathers at the beginning, turned into a full headdress later. Maybe it was just small stuff first. And so our traditions and rituals need to continue to evolve. We need to continue to adapt those, those ways because they do, uh, they allow us to look deeper into everything we're doing. For example, in the poultry system, uh, we generated a sacred uh, object that from the very beginning of our work. On the top of a, of a diamond willow staff, which we collected from a native community in, in Northern Minnesota, we brought that sacred object, which is, you know, the diamond bill and be, willow being sacred to those communities where we now reside. The hazelnut being the center of our poultry system because of the forest and nature of the blueprint of the chicken, we put the hazelnut on the top. And, and that represents the up, upward way of reflecting our two dimensionality, the, the two dimensional way we see the, the, the space we work with. Then, you know, on the, on the four cardinal points, we put the corn and the beans, which represented the, the union of the North and the South, corn being in our expression from the North and the beans from the South, even though that was already inter, interlaced. Then we moved on and put all the rest of the symbols to reflect not only the seven cardinal points of we understand them, we spoke about the four, um, and then there is the above, the below, and the center. And that gives you, in a, a spiritual form, and a sacred object gives you the expression of the system itself. And as you do that, you unlock so much more innate intelligence that would not come about without that process, you know, embracing that process and believing in it. And so at the end, this, the, the sacred object became the spiritual expression of the three-dimensional space we work with. And that is practically how we have access to this way of thinking and restored it so that we can permanently change the brain, uh, the, the pathways, the neurological pathways in our brain and so that we don't go back to that, you know, to that colonizing nature that we are all born with and that it begs to be put out because it likes to be out because it's enjoyable. It's, it, you know, it, it chases control and control is, is also in our nature. I mean, that colonizer is right in there just waiting for an opportunity. And this is the way to balance it out and to not to allow us to allow it to destroy all of the wisdom and capacity that we are born with and we are supposed to express in our lifetime. I know that went a bit longer, but I know you wanted some real examples and I hope that helps you. Thank you. Um, it, it looks like uh, in, the, in the question and answer, people are, are really thankful to be thinking with some new lexicon, with some new definitions in language, to be thinking about decolonization and re-indigenization. Uh, we have a comment here from uh, Autumn Alanza Almanza. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Looking forward to future regenerative councils in the USA. This is a path forward, needs more attention in the mainstream ag discourse. However, it could be easily co-opted by industrial interests. How can farmers, gardeners, and cons uh, customers engage in larger discussions without tempting colonist pollution of their important ideas? What can we do to avoid the outcome of a quote unquote brand in regenerative ag? Yeah, see, is, is the danger is always there because again, we are born both indigenous and colonizers. 
and it is the one we support and feed, the one that dominates. So, but if you look at the, at the inclusivity and the multiple layers of, of safety nets that un ancestral ways of organizing and, and governing were built with, it's not like it, it, they, that as if they hadn't worked and that, that, that they hadn't worked at a large scale. Remember that before the colonizers came to the United States, the whole continent was managed, literally managed by all of these native communities in a way that was continuously regenerating, but it isn't as if he was untouched, wild, or any of those colonizing terms that came to dominate the lexicon. The, the, the native communities used indigenous ways to manage the whole continent and do it for many thousands of years before. And so as we look through that, look at the governing structures that they use in the accountability systems. And in this diagram that Jeff briefly showed you, uh, that means a lot more uh, internalization. And I'm working on another publication now that will spell out a little bit in more detail how the councils come to be, how instead of electing council members, you raise council members. That creates a level of accountability that is not present in the so-called democratic election systems. Um, there, there is also circular, um, a circular nature where the, the individuals who, are, who become council members have to also be part of the very uh, um, community that they represent so that there is not someone from outside representing the interests of say our, us poultry producers have to be poultry producers, the one who serve in those councils because they would understand more deeply the, the struggles and the, the options and the possibilities and so on that of their affinity group. And so the layering gives us a lot of um, the, this ancestral way of balancing out the colonizer with the indigenous that we all have to live with. As far as corporations co-opting and all of that, I mean, that's already happening. Our own nonprofit organizations have already appropriated and co-opted and whitewashed this original ancestral way of thinking that we are now, and now has been discovered and it has been named regenerative and now is being appropriated and expropriated. And that's, that's inevitable because we live in a colonized world. But what you have to remember is that regenerative ways simply are. Regenerative is regenerative. It's either that or it's not. So you, can, you can't call something regenerative and because you did that, it automatically becomes regenerative. It either is or is not. And so you can brand market claims and all of that. And if we are to do that within the legitimate representation of the, you know, the Regenerative Congress of America, if we ever bring that together, if we had to do that and brands are, are, are part of it, those brands will be the expression of the whole collective from the top down and from the bottom up, rather than being a brand that comes out and takes over the, the ecosystem just for the purpose of extracting the value through a traditional supply chain managing infrastructure or colonizing infrastructure. So these are the things we have to process, become one with, embrace, and then defend and expand. That is how we, go, we will achieve a true regenerative future. And we know how to do that. And wherever we are struggled with, with knowledge, we can seek it through our own innate intelligence. And when that doesn't work, we go to the elders. There is plenty of them ready and willing to support these processes. And that's how we're going to ensure to the extent that we can, that the integrity stays within the process here. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an insight from Lenore Brick. If I'm understanding you, I welcome embracing the term indigenous to apply to all humans inhabiting the earth since the linguistic synonym is innate and rediscovering that inner wisdom and learning to trust it invites inclusivity. Any clarification that we're all created the same is necessary to cultivate the harmony we long for. And I would like to add to, for your response, Rehi, um, about re-indigenizing, but also being able to acknowledge the, the colonized systems that have made us 
different, although we are all human indigenous to the earth? In your answer. Yes, well, let me, let me just say that we're kind of starting to swim in much deeper waters that um, mm -hmm. we will be, and just, just to remind everyone that we have three more interventions. This is a conference that is going to go all the way through August, I believe. And we will be deepening the concepts that we introduced at this opening ceremony and opening um, platform. So let's, um, let's keep that in mind so that if you are feeling like you still have a lot of expressions you would like to bring out and to process, let's keep in mind that we'll have plenty of time. And if we are truly committed to building a regenerative system, we will be exploring every angle, processing it, and then embracing it and incorporating into our uh, regional councils, affinity groups and all of that. But I'll be explaining more in detail what I have learned. I will be transferring that knowledge that I have been given um, to through the, the new publication, but also through the workshops so that as you go through this process with, the, with this conference, you'll be able to go back and actually implement it in the communities where you live and, and you, well, in the communities you call home, let's put it that way. Uh, so that at the end of the day, we do become one in the context of the overall large scale ecosystem we, we need to build to, to deploy a regenerative system. And um, we do become one as part of that system, but we maintain our individual expressions and our individual identities, either as a person or as a community. Um, as a collective of, a, an, as an affinity group, or as a collective of affinity groups within a larger community or region. Those are the layers. And um, as we explore that, the very process of doing that requires that you first indigenize, meaning that you first become one with that origin, that we recognize it, that we literally look at our bodies as an expression of the evolutionary processes of the earth, as an expression of all the elements of the earth and as an expression of who we can be overall in our lifetime and how we can then transform that level of understanding into actual rituals and processes that allows us to, to not only keep our individuality and become fully who we were meant to be by creation itself, but also in relationship to our commonality, to the closest to us and to others that from which we will learn and depend on as we go forward. It really is, that is really the foundation of indigenization. It's not, it's not a methodology necessarily. It's, it's, it's a process of becoming, literally reclaiming the way we are born, both indigenous and colonizer and restarting our, our brain processes so we can recreate those, those uh, neural pathways that allows us to look at one thing, not only from a colonizing mindset, we'll still do that, but now we have one colonizing way of looking at it in 99 ways that are non-colonizing and achieving that requires that, that we keep looking at the same thing from different point of views, just like we did with white privilege. I give you some guidance on how you can look at it from many points of view. So can we uh, do the same thing with almost every other, other thing, every other of our expressions that we feel like needs further work. So I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, a short question is, I know that this is being recorded and will be made available. Uh, folks are asking if uh, any of your slides will be made available or the prayer at the beginning? Do you have a thought on that? Um, I did send it this morning. So um, those who are in charge of the technology, please make sure that it's included. And I did not even put my name on it. I did write it, but, but I would be taking ownership of expressions that were given to me I don't own those expressions. I wrote them, yes, and I didn't read a book or called anyone, but that doesn't mean they are just mine. They, that's who I am, is what is expressed in that, in that 
or re, uh, not opening uh, meditation. But it is not like I'm the only one who's that way. And I'm not that way because of myself. I'm that way because of communities I've grown with and mentors who have helped me think that way. So I, will, I would ask that it is made available but that it is kept not anonymous because it is not. It is an expression of everyone who wants to embrace that way of thinking. So call it your own. Just don't, don't appropriate it. I'm not appropriating it so that you, so you can see how it can be done. Um, and so go and use it in any way you want and then credit it to our ancestors again, just like I just did and continue that chain let not anyone interrupt it. Mm, thank you. Uh, David MC kind of echoes that thought. He says, Reginaldo, your experience of bringing old knowledge back through meditation and attunement, i.e. knowledge is like energy, never dies, just recycles. Got that related to what you just said. Uh, we have a question here about how this can be applied maybe on a larger level. Linda, Hezel, in my experience, county level planning and zoning rules and regulations are highly extractive and favor natural resource extraction or plundering. Are these are there examples of counties um, which have addressed decolonization in policy or practice that you're aware of? Not in the traditional government organization structures. There are folks, um, my own township in Northfield, Minnesota, uh, Waterford, they have fought for the preservation of the landscape, the beauty of the landscape, the farming characters and all that, which is, to their credit, is a step towards that recognition that that life needs to be there, needs to continue, not just pavement and roads and shopping malls. Um, but to the extent that a county or a township has transformed the whole set of policies and indigenize them and decolonize them. I don't know if a single one, except within fully re, re, what we call liberated territories that have been reclaimed by the native ancestral communities of that area. And to that end, we know of at least, you know, a couple dozen directly right here in Guatemala and in Mexico and in British Columbia, where they, this is the way they are planning, but it doesn't mean that they have 100% control because obviously everywhere we go, the land already has been claimed by some sort of government, colonizing government structure, so that they are always in the way. But where, they, where the local ancestral governments have been re re restored, some, uh, that kind of expression is coming more full, fully into, into the planning processes and so on. So if you wanna look at the hereditary chiefs out of British Columbia, as one of those examples. If you want to look at CEDRO, C-E-D-R-O, um, you can put it in the chat if you want to. CEDRO in Guatemala has been bringing, in fact, the, the diagram I showed you, I learned that in 1986 and 87 um, from the elders in the Comunidad of Chuicastun up in the highlands of, um, you know, the, up the higher parts of Totonicapan in Guatemala when CEDRO was just beginning. And now they have, fully integrated that way of governing and organizing across many hundreds of communities, which are now gaining a lot more power and influence on bringing those ancestral ways for protecting large tracts of, of communal lands, the commons in that region. So those examples are really, really good to see because obviously they are thriving. It's not like they are compromising their economic well-being while protecting life and and enhancing it and, and so on. And those are really cohesive communities too, which means the social fabric is strong, which means the kids are healthier mentally, which means the future adults will be also healthier uh, mentally, physically, and spiritually. And so very, very good question and very inspiring to see those places because not only do they teach us uh, a lot, but also they are, they are evidence that this is a better way. Mm hmm. Yeah. And uh, Bill Taylor also adds a good point about some of these rights of nature laws we're starting to get see, uh, you know, could also be uh, an example of this uh, passed in some counties, he says, in Pennsylvania around fracking, 
we know we've started to see a couple rivers get rights in the world. So I hope that trend rights of nature ordinances are also would expand. Uh, this is a good, interesting question from Ian Graham. I found it, uh, oh wait, sorry, here we go. Uh, are we homogenizing the obvious diversity of indigenous wisdom as though it is all the same world over and across history, especially since so many of those cultures have been mortally wounded by the colonizers? There's, you can't homogenize indigenous wisdom. It is by nature innate to every individual on earth. And because of that very foundation, it is as diverse as the population and the other organisms on the earth. Because remember, indigenous wisdom is not about humans alone. In fact, we have very little innate indigenous wisdom on our own. The reason our brain is able to develop those connections and eventually become coordinated enough that we can express them in the form we do today is because of our interaction with all of those other organisms. There is no homogenization in nature. And that is the foundation of the, of the structure of indigenous wisdom. And so now uh, that's, um, th think of a few other angles to look at that. Um, think about the, just the interaction with a, you know, if you're an eight year old and I was about eight, interacting with scorpions in the rainforest. Uh, honestly, at that age, you got no limitations. You got no inhibitions. And even with the war going on, we were still like, that was just something that was going on. And as long as you didn't feel physically threatened right in the moment, you learned to live with it. And that opened up so much more, so many expressions to the extent that in the forest, looking at a scorpion and thinking about how everybody wanted to kill that scorpion and yet not wanted to do it because you wanted to see what it, what it was like. And you wonder, what is it thinking? Why is it going in that direction? I mean, you know, so many things. That is foundational uh, innate intelligence developing right there at that age. It's not gonna be homogenized. It's not gonna be the same for anybody else. That's a unique experience I went through. I wrote some of this in my book, it's called in the shadow of green men. You can order it from Acres USA. And that would give you more perspective as to the extensiveness of this uh, area of intellectual growth. Um, and, and, and then of course, there are principles. And yes, those are universal. And th but it's not about homogenization, it's really about having sets of principles, governing principles on which we can then agree with each other as to how we are supposed to approach certain issues such as how to manage the forest, how to manage say common wealth and, and you, know, this, you know, wealth distribution and things like that. And so those principles, and in our case, we divided them into five areas, you know, areas of principles of fairness, and then of course, there is a whole set of criteria, a whole set of indicators and a whole set of verifiers that allows us to track what is fair and what is not based on the conditions of a space and all of that. It's not a cookie cutter, it's not homogenized even at that level across the world because what's fair here where I am right now, it may not be fair if I'm a worker at a processing meat processing facility in Minnesota. And so that fairness needs to be guided by principles rather than by instructions or codes of conduct or stuff like that. Principles are definitely uh, the only universal sort of um, governing um, language that we are supposed to continue to evolve in. And also remember that the ecosystem and the governance of that ecosystem is not only you know, completely inclusive of every expression because the, the ecosystem doesn't define who can be part of it and who doesn't. The only uh, organisms that can define if they are or not part of the ecosystem is those affinity groups that have organized themselves because they have found that they are not represented in the ecosystem. And it is their right and it is their prerogative to organize, self-organize, to develop the capacity to represent themselves and then to integrate themselves into the ecosystem. The ecosystem by principle should never have a criteria 
that defines who can and cannot be there, except on the basis of principles of bigotry, hate, violence. Yes, well, those are those are not principles uh, on which uh, people are even going to want to be part of the system anyway. Um, but anyway, anyway, I, I'll leave it at that because because this is not the, the the right time to deepen further. Mm hmm. People are definitely looking for more resources. Um, I included your recommendation for Sherry Mitchell, Sacred Instructions in the chat. Uh, we have a comment here from Root to Heaven. Uh, hi, my, my organization Root to Heaven has been doing work in the Teuna, the Sierra Madres. We've been very blessed to work alongside indigenous elders from all over the planet. I want to appreciate the invitation to consider that we are all indigenous because we share the same grandparents, the elements. I also want to say that while some nations are very open, others are not. And it's important to respect the doors that are not open and to keep moving forward where they are. Also, as an organization that works with indigenous nations, I really feel it's important to reconsider what we feel are quote unquote reparations. Because a lot of times we think we're helping by offering touristic philanthropic practices, but the real help that's needed to make true reparation takes that honesty, simplicity and relationship that opens and evolves through mutual interdependence. Thank you so much for this, really inspired over here. Uh, we, have, we have a question just you know, about offerings of, of a roadmap for uh, how we can move forward in this. And I think what you're saying is that we will be able to deepen this throughout this, uh, this convergence, this uh, decentralized uh, soil and nutrition conference over the next eight months. Um, and folks are asking, is there a platform that we can be in conversation and share our thoughts between our weekly sessions? Uh, so maybe that's just for, for administrators um, or for, for, for Dan to think about, um, to articulate our new ideas <clears throat> and personal processes that we're dealing with in terms of stepping into these directions. Um, Let's see, I appreciate Carrie Zellman, I appreciate being given some more language with which to express the process of collective awakening and re-indigenizing that we're all part of. Language represents thought and mindset. We need the language to communicate and normalize the collective healing process as we engage in conversations within our communities. For example, being a steward versus a consumer and more deeply understanding the concepts of indigenous and colonization, thank you. Um, information, contact information, uh, how to share contact information. Maybe you just put it, put it in the chat. Is that the best? I'll leave that to Chris. I'll just hop in for a second. Um, <clears throat> we were hoping that there would be interest in engaging as a community, um, through this process over the next few months. And so, uh, that, yeah, that's absolutely our intention. We wanted to get this process going and um, yeah, um, <laughs> feel free to send suggestions via email to us uh, about what you think would be valuable and uh, ways you'd like to you know, be able to engage others. Um, there's really a, an exquisite uh, group of people that are registered and attending. Um, the logistics of being able to have everyone speak at the same time on a Zoom call is, is quite difficult, but that does not mean that we can't uh, facilitate this deeper process. Uh, Rehi, uh, I'm not sure what it was a month or so ago, was asking why we're calling it a conference. We should call it a convergence. I think Lindsay used that term. Um, the idea is not to have it be a top-down uh, speaker attendees kind of a dynamic, but to really facilitate a, a collective engagement. And so, um, we're going to work on it. I have no promises, and we're very welcome to uh, suggestions. And um, you know, uh, we will we will be receptive, and we are looking forward to this process. So that's probably <laughs> all I can say right now. We've we've completed our our you know um, predicted hour and a half uh, period. I just want to express great gratitude to Rehi for stepping up and sharing, and I think his third language uh, being so eloquent and so. Um, um, you know, just <clears throat> leading, leading with his heart and, and sharing some insights that he has access to from his background uh, that a lot of us don't. So 
it's a process. Um, and we're really grateful to have started it here today and have had you as uh, leading it, Rehi. Thank you. Yes, and somebody was asking about how to stay in touch and stuff, and I don't know if the, the directory is available, how, but um, maybe. Our, our thought is that we were gonna be, we did this a couple of years ago at the conference, maybe it was four or five years ago, where we actually had a little questionnaire um, where you could say your name, if you wanted to, your name, your address, your website, your your you know email, phone number, what your interests are, um, so that anybody who's an attendee uh, and wants to put themselves out there can facilitate that um, that connection. So you can at least see who the people are around and who you want to reach out to. So um, we will respect people's privacy if they choose to retain it, but also if they would like to say, I'm part of this process and I'd like to meet other people, um, that's where we're aiming to, aiming to um, at least start the communication process. It's been a, a bit overwhelming, uh, all the registrations and all the logistics, <laughs> but it's, uh, <clears throat> yeah, we're just getting started, so. It looks like the chat is very, very active, so, and, um, so we are dwindling now, and I think you are closing. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Everyone. Thank you all very much.